Hello. Most people associate archaeology with excavation at particular sites, but for landscape archaeology, one of the most important field methods at our disposal is archaeological survey, which involves searching regions. Certainly landscape archaeology can include excavations at selected sites, but archaeological survey provides an opportunity for archaeologists to discover traces not only of campsites and villages and that sort of thing, but also dispersed activities across landscapes. One of the reasons that survey is important is that archaeological excavations only give small glimpses into what was going on in the past. Typically, they only sample the evidence for some of the activities that occurred in a village or a campsite, for example, and might tell us little or nothing about activities that took place outside sites or villages or campsites. Archaeological survey normally operates on a much larger scale and not only tells us how those towns, villages, and campsites are distributed on landscapes, but can sometimes give us clues about relationships between them. In addition, it can give us evidence about activities that took place outside of these sites. For example, by identifying places where certain kinds of intensive agriculture took place. Especially when they include a geoarchaeological component, surveys can also tell us something about changes to landscapes over time. And today, archaeological survey is extremely important in heritage management. Wherever there is risk that modern development, such as construction of roads or subdivisions, might damage important archaeological resources, archaeological surveys may precede this development in order to ensure that no damage is done, or that the damage is mitigated through excavation. With all this variety of reasons for doing archaeological surveys, the way we design surveys should also vary accordingly. One possible way to classify surveys is by their ultimate purpose. With categories for informal reconnaissance, purpose of survey or prospection, sampling, and surveying for spatial structure. Reconnaissance often constitutes a preliminary stage of survey, allowing archaeologists to become familiar with the territory they're about to search, as well as some of the site and artifact types that they might encounter. When this involves survey by vehicle, archaeologists sometimes call these windshield surveys. Purpose of survey or prospection involves searching for particular targets or particular kinds of targets. A classic example is a search for a shipwreck site that takes advantage of historical information on the most likely place where the ship went down. But it can also involve searching for historic sites whose locations are only approximately known, such as historic forts or searching for particular kinds of sites whose locations are not known but that are very difficult to detect. Today, purpose of survey often involves predictive modeling in a GIS. Sampling surveys involve searching only a subset of the spaces in the region of interest, with the goal of making inferences about the characteristics of the larger population in the region. Such characteristics could include the proportion of sites that fall into a particular category, for example. There's a variety of sampling strategies that archaeologists can use in these situations, including random ones, stratified random samples, and systematic samples. Surveying for spatial structure involves searching for patterns in the relationships among sites and features that something like a random sample would be highly unlikely to reveal. For example, we might be interested in finding a hierarchy among site types or detecting road systems or canal systems. In many cases, aerial survey will be a key part of doing this kind of research. As you might expect, in many instances, archaeologists use combinations of these strategies, often beginning with general reconnaissance then perhaps using a sampling approach and rounding out the project with purpose of survey targeted at site types that were not very well represented in the sample. Archaeologists have a variety of methods at their disposal to conduct archaeological surveys. Field walking or pedestrian survey is one of the most important of these methods in part because of its relatively low cost. Field walking can be very effective in areas with relatively high visibility 
meaning there isn't too much vegetation or overlying sediment that would tend to prevent surveyors from seeing artifacts on the ground. Under such conditions, surveyors can sometimes also see features, such as shallow depressions marking the locations of pit houses, or rows of stones indicating stone walls that are buried. Geophysical surveys rely on variations in the magnetic or electrical characteristics or the density of things that are buried in the ground. Their advantage is that overlying sediment is effectively transparent to them, so that they can provide at least a blurry picture of buried features, such as walls and ditches. On the other hand, they tend to require very closely spaced measurements, which makes them relatively costly. Consequently, archaeologists tend to use these methods only where they have reasonably high expectations that they will succeed in finding something. In addition, they're generally not sensitive enough to identify most kinds of individual artifacts, and when they do detect archaeological features, it requires excavation in order to identify them and date them. Where visibility is not amenable to field walking, but the archaeological remains are relatively shallow, a common method for archaeological survey is shovel testing which is particularly common in cultural resource management. This involves digging relatively small and regularly spaced pits through the topsoil and then screening the excavated sediment to find artifacts. This method is adequate for sampling types of surveys, but actually has fairly low probabilities of detecting sites unless those sites are relatively large and have relatively high artifact densities. On the other hand, it's not obvious what other methods to use to detect sites in grassy or forested areas. Where overlying sediment is too thick for shovel testing to be effective, archaeologists sometimes use coring or augering or even backhoes to penetrate those sediments. Backhoes provide relatively wide exposures and can be used to make systematic parallel transects across a space. However, you would never use it across a large region. Cores and augers have such small diameters that their probability of detecting most kinds of artifacts is very low. However, they can still be effective at detecting buried anthropogenic soils, as well as small bits of charcoal and even micro-artifacts that might indicate the presence of a site. A much less costly alternative to these methods that's possible in some areas is simply to examine exposures of buried sediments that nature has provided for us in the sides of gullies or along eroded coastlines as well as exposures from modern construction activities, like road building. In some regions, a very important archaeological field method is chemical survey. This involves analyzing regularly spaced soil samples for chemical signatures of human occupation, of which the most important one is elevated phosphate levels. Today, very important methods for archaeological survey are aerial photography and satellite imagery. These can sometimes help us detect sites, but they're also important for helping us detect the areas where we're most likely to find sites, making them an important tool in the production of archaeological predictive models. Over the past decade, drone survey has become an increasingly important part of archaeologists' arsenal for aerial archaeological survey. It has the advantage of being relatively inexpensive and that it can be programmed to follow systematic transects if that is desirable. Although it's not that effective for detecting individual artifacts, it is extremely useful for photographing crop marks and traces of architecture, as well as color variations that might signal anthropogenic soils. Underwater and intertidal surveys employ many of the same methods just mentioned, but need to be adapted to their unique environmental situations. I'll discuss these kinds of surveys in a little bit more detail toward the end of the video. In many surveys, the target of interest is called a site. Sites can be the remnants of settlements, like villages and campsites, for example. They can also be cemeteries or monuments, or cliff faces or boulders with rock art. And they can also be caves. In many archaeological surveys, sites are just areas with elevated densities of artifacts, which might mark the location of some of the site types previously mentioned, but could also occur for a variety of other reasons. In cultural resource management, legislation often requires us to think of surveys in terms of sites. However, 
not all archaeological surveys focus on sites. Some archaeologists, while recognizing the importance of settlement sites, are more interested in surveying the territories around those settlements. This kind of survey is often called off-site survey and can involve searching for evidence of those practices that took place in the rural areas around those settlements. And then there are archaeologists who do not recognize the site concept at all. They often claim to use artifacts as their units of observation. This kind of survey, often called non-site survey or distributional survey, requires extremely intensive examination of the ground, sometimes even while crawling on hands and knees. The high cost that the most intensive forms of distributional archaeology entail relative to more traditional forms like field walking tends to limit their application to relatively small survey areas. When designing any type of survey, it's important to take into account a number of factors that can affect the outcome. Visibility has to do with environmental characteristics that can make it easier or harder to detect archaeological artifacts and other traces of past human activity. For visual detection, for example in field walking, the most important of these are overlying sediment, vegetation cover, and lighting conditions, which can vary depending on the time of day as well as the season. However, for some methods, such as ground penetrating radar, sediment and vegetation are effectively transparent. By obtrusiveness, archaeologists refer to the characteristics of the targets themselves, or more properly, how those targets contrast with their environments. For example, if we were to use magnetic survey, a buried iron cannon would really stand out in most kinds of sediments. But it wouldn't stand out at all if it were buried in a pile of iron ball bearings. In a more realistic example, field walkers searching for pottery and lithics on the surface of the ground are much more likely to see them if their colors contrast with the color of the soil. In some desert areas, the soil consists of flint regasol, where flint artifacts are extremely hard to distinguish from the natural flint stones around them. It often happens that areas that were selected for survey turn out to be inaccessible. For example, the proposed survey area might be occupied by an army base, or worse yet, a minefield. Or it could be covered by deep sediment or asphalt, which is really a problem of visibility. More commonly, it could just have an uncooperative landowner, or there could be a vicious dog guarding the property, or other safety concerns, like steep cliffs. Another important consideration is survey intensity, or the density of effort that one invests in the survey. Archaeologists often measure this by the distance between transects when they use methods like field walking, or the distance between shovel tests or chemical or geophysical observations. But you could also measure it by the number of person hours or person days invested per some unit of space. A concept closely related to intensity is coverage, which is the percentage of the surveyed area which is effectively swept by the surveyors. It's just the total area within which we'd expect to have found targets, here shown in blue, divided by the total surveyed region, here in green. Although here I've shown coverage for parallel transects in a regular region, the coverage would be exactly the same if we rearranged those transects so that they wandered all over the region randomly. Another factor to consider is the capability of the detector, which for field walking happens to be the surveyor's eyes. Surveyors vary in their ability to detect different kinds of artifacts, some being more likely to notice pottery sherds on the ground, while others are better at noticing lithics. This also holds true when they're searching screens during subsurface survey, while detectors like magnetometers and electromagnetic surveying devices also vary in their capabilities. One characteristic of detectors is their range. Geophysical detectors, for example, vary in how deeply they can penetrate the ground, while field walkers vary in how far away they can see artifacts of various kinds. We can actually summarize all these factors mathematically with something called detection functions. One kind of detection function represents the relationship between search effort, as measured in search time or coverage, and the probability of detecting artifacts or sites or any other kind of target. The important thing to notice here is that this function not only varies from place to place, but it's non-linear, so that at some point, investing more effort in search really doesn't accomplish anything.
Another kind of detection function describes the relationship between discovery probability and range. The probability of detecting targets falls off with distance away from the detector, and how quickly it falls off depends on such things as visibility and, as seen here, artifact type. For human detectors, the only way to determine these detection functions is by experiment. For example, we can have field walkers walk down the middle of a field seeded with artifacts in known locations to measure their success at detecting them. I'll discuss this process in more detail in another video. Much as there are standardized patterns for marine search and rescue for downed planes and the survivors of shipwrecks, archaeological surveyors also have standardized search patterns. For field walking, the most common practice is to use parallel transects some fixed distance apart. The spacing between transects depends on project objectives and context and can vary from 1 or 2 meters to more than 100 meters. Some projects have used wavy transects instead of straight ones with the idea that that would encourage surveyors to scan the ground from different angles. Where surveyors make two passes on the same parcel of ground, it is optimal for the second pass to be at a diagonal to the first. For purposes of surveys with the aim of finding a particular target, such as an historical fort whose location is only approximately known, an expanding square search can be very useful, with search beginning at the point where the target is predicted to occur. Survey by subsurface tests, such as shovel tests, test pits, or augering, almost always conform to some kind of grid. The grid most commonly used is a square grid. If the object of the survey is to estimate parameters of some population of artifacts, most kinds of grids will operate almost equally well. If, however, the object is to find sites, then a square grid is less effective than the other alternatives because it has a lower probability of intersecting sites of a given size. An offset grid has a slightly higher probability of intersection, while an equilateral triangular grid has a much higher one for circular targets. Another possibility for sampling surveys is to use random points, while more targeted survey could also use purposive selection of SST points. Today, the most common uses of archaeological survey are in heritage management or cultural resource management. In advance of development projects like construction of a subdivision or a shopping mall, teams of archaeologists survey the area where the development is proposed to take place to see if there are any archaeological sites that would suffer adverse impacts from the development. This tends to be a highly regulated environment with laws, standards, and guidelines that vary from jurisdiction to jurisdiction. But in most cases, those standards and guidelines do still provide some latitude for variation in the design of a survey. For example, they might vary the density of shovel tests or use predictive modeling in a GIS to focus increased densities of effort in areas most likely to be impacted. So far, I've focused on terrestrial surveys, but it's important to keep in mind that archaeologists do underwater and intertidal surveys as well. Many underwater surveys are focused on the discovery of shipwrecks, and sometimes we can use historical information to use purpose of survey that focuses on the areas most likely to contain the shipwreck. However, underwater survey is also really important in areas where rising sea levels have flooded sites that were originally terrestrial. For example, the shallow waters around and between the Isles of Scilly, west of Cornwall, England, are full of the well-preserved remains of Bronze Age villages, farms, and farm fields, and several submerged Neolithic villages are known off the coast of Israel. And key evidence for our understanding of the peopling of the New World might lie on the continental shelf off the coast of British Columbia. Intertidal survey is kind of a compromise between terrestrial and underwater survey. It involves searching for archaeological traces that are flooded at high tide, but exposed to the air at low tide. Archaeologists are involved in sort of a race against time when they do intertidal survey, with search transects that advance as the waters are retreating, and then have to retreat as the waters rise. Intertidal surveys are important not only for detecting flooded village sites like those just mentioned, but also coastal installations, sunken ships, and features like fishing weirs, 
As usual, the video you've just seen only touches on many of the topics that are relevant to archaeological survey, and I expect to produce some more videos that go into some of these topics in greater detail. Furthermore, if you'd like to learn more about archaeological survey, you might have a look at my book, Archaeological Survey, published by Springer. It has chapters that discuss many of these aspects, including purpose of survey, sampling surveys, and the kinds of factors that affect the detection of archaeological sites and artifacts when we do archaeological surveys. Thank you. Stay safe.